This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for signing in. And welcome again. This is a unique experiment we're trying where we have 24 hours of R on the R discussions of various issues around the commons. And this is just a, a way that we're trying to see that uh, to get more people around the world involved together in discussing or thinking about ideas of the commons. So let me just get up my presentation here for a second and uh, then we can. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I hope you can hear me. I'm down with a bad throat, so my voice is a bit uh, hoarse, but uh, this is. So I want to talk today about um, issues of the urban commons in India. And uh, part of the issue is we think of commons largely in rural areas and we don't really think about the ideas of commons in public places. And this is based on research that I and my colleagues Seema Mundoli and Amrita Sen have been doing at the Center for Urban Ecological Sustainability at Azim Premji University in Bangalore in India. So why urban commons? Why is this important even? because the world is experiencing a massive urban transition as you can see from this nightlight satellite image a lot of the lit areas which are the urban areas of the world areas that are lit at night are uh, now spreading across the world so parts of india and china for instance which are, would have been largely rural even 20 years ago are rapidly re approaching uh, urban transition we're already a world that is more than 50 percent living in cities and uh, by 2050 or thereabouts it's anticipated that we're going to be a world that is more than 75% urban. India will play a major role in this. And uh, we already have three of the world's largest cities and three of the world's fastest growing cities. There are projections that uh, in 10 years time, Delhi will overtake Tokyo as the world's largest city. So we're dealing with a country that is experiencing a massive transition in terms of urbanization. But we're also realizing that we know very little about what makes urban commons stick, so to speak. And you know, in what context can they be preserved? And a lot of this has to do with our imaginations of what the city is and our norms of how we act in the city, and hence the title of this presentation. So if you look at the growth of cities from 1990 to 2014, it's dominated by countries like India and China and Nigeria, surprisingly enough. But we know very little about what is taking place in cities like this, because most of our research so far globally on cities has been in places like North America or Europe or even parts of Asia such as Hong Kong or Japan, which are very different from <coughs> global South cities like Indonesia or Bangladesh or uh, India or other countries in Central Africa or East Africa. And yet these are the countries which are going to hold the world's lion, the lion's share of urbanization in the next 10, 20 years. So we really need a more of a knowledge base on how to achieve sustainability. So this work draws on long-term research that we've been doing in Bangalore and uh, or looking at nature and people and how they interact through commons, looking at a very long time slice. We're looking at uh, changes from the sixth century AD or thereabouts onwards all the way to the present. And so with this, I try and draw together a number of threads looking at the urban commons. And this is uh, based on research that we do definitely as uh, scholars of the commons, but it's also wearing multiple hats. We're also residents. We live near places which are commons. We use the commons. We work with communities in various ways to restore and protect the commons. We are in our individual capacities, have worked with activist groups in various ways. We provide research uh, information to activist groups. And we are very strong believers in the communication of science to the public. So we do a lot of outreach. So you know, in different ways. Uh, I'm a parent of a child that is growing up in a city which is rapidly losing its commons, for instance. And so as a mother, that's something I'm very concerned about. So how do we deal with commons in these multiple imaginations? And what future does the commons have in urban spaces? Let's look at the history of Bangalore. Bangalore itself is a city in a semi-arid area. So it's an unusual settlement because it's in a place that was devoid of any access to large water sources, no large rivers, no coast. It doesn't have much rainfall either. So how did 
it become an ancient civilized settled place it's because of commons because what people did was they they dug holes in the ground where they had natural depressions and used this to store rainwater in places that were tanks that uh, irrigation tanks that they call later became called as lakes these had grazing areas next to them they had cemeteries where people buried their dead they had open wells which people used for water they had groves of trees which supplied firewood so they were multifaceted commons fishing areas firewood shade fruit fodder all kinds of resources common resources that people derived from these landscapes and you can see from this inscription it's a stone inscription found in a village that was outside uh, close to what is modern day bangalore and which talks about uh, the particular commons in this area which was given as a land grant to the temple and the temple in these areas was a public place uh, so the land grant which talked about the temple but also the surroundings the wet and dry lands including the wells underground and the trees overground and you see here how, what a beautiful three dimensional view they had of a common landscape it wasn't just the resources that you saw on top like the trees above but also the in so in, in some sense the invisible but equally important common resources like the wells below the ground which were also part of the common landscape and which supplied life giving water so bangalore was a city that grew with the commons hand in hand and in 1537 you can see the tiny red dot in the center of this uh, map so this was the start of the market town of bangalore founded by kempegowda who was a local ruler in 1537 the city grew and grew in subsequent periods till it's now the kind the massive urban agglomeration that you see now with about 12 million people so it's a very large city one of india's fastest growing cities how did this urbanization change the way we looked at commons you can see that it didn't no at least not in the beginning if you look at a poem which talks about bangalore in the 1640s it describes nature very much as public spaces as commons the city teemed with deep lakes each house was grazed by a well there were fountains that gurgled at every square home gardens had trees thick with flowers and shade that supplied everybody the city itself was girdled by a bottomless moat and dotted with countless lakes and there were picturesque parks parks festooned with creepers swinging gaily in the breeze so nature in this place was very much a public space of lakes of fountains and squares of street trees that lined home gardens of parks festooned with creepers that were accessible to everyone so this concept continued and up to the 1790s in fact when the british came into bangalore and drew what is the first map that is available to us you can see a city full of lakes and a few groves of trees and a few scattered trees along streets and from then onwards when the british took over they continuously added more and more lakes and more and more trees to this landscape so this is another map in 1888 which shows you i'll just go back to the 1791 map for a second and now back to 1888 again and you can see that there are many more lakes that have been created many more trees that have been added all as public resources trees because this city a colonial city you know for the british coming into bangalore it was a hot place and they needed trees to provide shade but these trees were largely planted some in bungalows but largely in public spaces in parks and along road sides and on the border of lakes lakes were created for water for irrigation water but they also supplied cattle they also supplied uh, fish you know a lot of other common resources <clears throat> and then at some point this relationship of growing city with growing commons breaks down and perhaps that's inevitable as industrialization progresses what happens is in the 1890s bangalore starts getting piped water and at this point lakes or tanks are no longer revered they were worshiped as sacred they had lake goddesses and there were a lot of uh, festivals around the lake that kept it as a very strong community resource but all of this starts to break down in the heart of the city in the 1890s once pipe water comes in and you can look at archival records and see that people start slowly talking about lakes as malarial as swampy areas as sources of disease a very different imagination wells also you know people start throwing corpses in the wells during the time of plague and in the indian concept when water is sacred i mean one would never throw a corpse into a well because it would be a very defiling act it's not something that can be cleaned chemically and still used it's still mentally a defiling act so this gives you a sense of the lack of involvement of you know treatment of the commons in any serious way in any respectful way and sure enough if you go back to if you fast forward to 2015 you just we have a 
you know, barely any lakes left in the heart of the city, just a few fragments of lakes. I'll go back again to 1888, and you can see that there were many more lakes, most of which have disappeared, and the ones that are there are about half the size they used to be. So this then is a case of urbanization and lakes. They were used in many, many ways. It's not, not just for water, as I said. They were used for cattle grazing. They were used by commercial laundress called thobies. They were used by migrant labor or very poor for washing their livestock or clothes. And uh, the, you know, not just for, so they were used for fishing, for firewood. And when uh, the lake bed dried during the summer, the weeds, the grassy green weeds that grew on them were picked by women and used for cooking. So they were nutritional supplements. They were, each lake had a tope or a village forest adjacent to it. These have largely been converted into waste dumps. At one point, they used to supply fruit. So they were largely fruiting trees like jackfruit or mango. They supplied timber. These are very important timber trees. They supplied fuel wood. Under the trees, a lot of grass grew. So these were grazing grounds. There were cemeteries next to these places where people were buried. So they were public places for burial, for remembering ancestors. All of this is now gone. We did a study where if we looked at 47 of these uh, village forests in the peri-urban area, and there were only three remaining. The rest have become waste dumps. They've become built spaces, or they've become beatific parks with timings and rules and exclusion of the very poor or the you know, indigenous communities that once depended on them. And the same is true again for wooded streets. Wooded streets were, you know, street trees are another very important thriving common. So this is one of Bangalore's largest roads, Kia Road. And it had these uh, ficus trees, which were extremely important. People used to stay, you know, a lot of uh, street uh, vendors and people different kinds used to live under these trees, canopies. And this is the same KR road today. It's become a high speed road. The Metro flyover is coming up on this. And the loss of trees has also meant a loss of a way of life for street vendors whom we've interviewed. They used to live under these trees and um, actually some of the most iconic street vendor communities of India, of Bangalore, which used to make bamboo products that everyone knew. For me, it was you know, a childhood part of the city, the very much part of my memories growing up. They're still there. You can see the huts, but uh, they're slowly getting to get displaced. As the last trees get cut, and they will as this you know, road widening proceeds, the street vendors are going to get forced out. So the lack of a public commons in this expanding city, where is the space for commons in an expanding city? And this brings me really to the main message of this talk. This is what we started when we did our research. And as we started talking about this to people, we landed up coming up against an imagination that largely said, look, this is very true. We feel very bad about this. But isn't this inevitable in a city that is modern, that is developing, that is going to grow? Where is the space for commons? There is no space for commons. There is no space for nature. These are all places that should be in the rural areas. This is not something that we need in our cities. So is urbanization an inevitable tale of commons lost? Or can it be, and is it, a story of commons reimagined, of commons rediscovered, of reclaimed and reforged? And if so, what would this new urban commons be? So this has been a large focus of our research then in the past three years. And we've come across many inspiring people. One, just to give you an example, and they come from all walks of life, is Honama Govindaya, my friend's grandmother, actually, who was a homemaker, a single mother of 10, lost her husband early, raised 10 children by herself, ran the house and still found the time in between raising the 10 children to petition public officials and take a case all the way to the Supreme Court of India to single-handedly save a public park in the face of grave opposition. She had people throwing stones at night in her house at night. You know, she had all kinds of threats against her. But she saved this playground because she said her children used it and she wanted future generations of children to use it. She's now 93 and can't really visit the park that often, but she still lives off opposite it. And she has individually supervised the planting of most bushes and trees here and restored it into a playground and a place of nature for children against incredible odds. And she's not unusual. There are a number of people that do this. In addition to people, there are also communities that save commons. And Bangalore, especially over the past 10 years, has witnessed a lot of citizen movements towards lake rejuvenation. And these are not just for Bangalore. You now see them in Chennai and Coimbatore and many other Indian cities. So what drives these movements? Having been part of one, Kaikondrili Lake, where these photographs come, and this is close to my house, I can tell you that it's been a very interesting collaboration between citizens and the municipality. And uh, it's really a polycentric form of governance, where citizens are on site, who know exactly what they want, 
raise the money, but also develop the vision of how they want their lake to be. And the municipality who has to come in, stop encroachment, stop pollution, uh, provide the technical and the financial you know, inputs that are required <coughs> Excuse me, for lake restoration. So this is a lake that has been restored and converted into a bird paradise. You know, the kinds of birds that we have, we have close to 70 or 80 species that are coming here, nesting, migratory birds. It's a haven surrounded by apartments, high-rise buildings, a very busy road, you know, on all sides. So the fact that this kind of a lake can be turned on in the heart of a busy city tells us that the story of commons is not just a tragedy of commons lost. It can also be a story of commons found. In fact, Lynn Ostrom came to this lake in 2012, a few months before she died in February, and recognized community efforts by planting a jackfruit tree at the site. And Lynn said that, uh, for those of you who know Lynn, she grew up in Los Angeles and she knew the jackfruit tree because she said in her mother's home she had a jackfruit. So this tree still thrives. There's a, the sign that you see at the back next to it. People come, look at this jackfruit tree as they're walking around the lake. Some of them have no idea who Eleanor Rostrom was, but then they go and look her up and then find out that you know their small lake is, 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 was a lake that was put on this global spot by Eleanor Rostrom. The lake has served as a node in many ways. It attracts, there's a lake festival that is done every year and it attracts over a thousand, close to a thousand visitors. There are children of all kinds, adult activities for adults, people come together to celebrate the lake. So it's become a very important common space for the neighborhood. People who have met here have gone on to get involved in a lot of other things, traffic agitations, working with government schools. It's a place where people who did not know each other in a fragmented city could come together and learn and work for, with each other to start doing various other things, getting involved in a number of other commons issues that they would otherwise not have, you know, they didn't even know each other. So where would they have begun? Uh, in fact, some of the people working in this lake have spearheaded a, a waste management program for Bangalore called Two Bin One Bag that the High Court has ordered implemented across Bangalore. So there's all sorts of very interesting things that have grown out of this one lake. This lake and a couple of other lakes, Jakur Lake and Putinhali Lake, which are also very well known commons, restored commons in Bangalore, have served as knowledge nodes for revival of a number of other lakes in the city. So now there are a number of aspiring lake communities who want to come together and rejuvenate a lake. And the entire exercise that we went through as part of the initial Kaikondrili Lake Rejuvenation Committee, I can tell you we were very clueless when we began. We didn't know how to find out which officials to talk to, how to get a plan, what did, how to read a detailed project report, how to make objections, how to ask for more information. You know, what a lake should be rejuvenated like? You know, what are the do's and don'ts that we need to get people to push through? So these, are, these lakes now act as important knowledge nodes. And this helps the commons propagate from one location to another. And this is something that is very important in an urban landscape because you are fragmented in terms of space and time, but you're also connected in social media in a way that you weren't before. So one lake can help communicate to other lake groups in a very in ways that were not possible before in rural areas. Lake groups have also come together to form pan-Bangalore associations, and they have started doing things which are, including, for instance, protests against wetland encroachment. So one of Bangalore's largest lakes, Belandur Lake, which is now very much in the news for foaming and pollution, uh, globally also, one, so its wetland was being uh, threatened by large-scale construction. <coughs> so the Pan-Bangalore group got together and submitted a public interest litigation to prevent uh, the lake uh, wetland from being encroached. And that had massive protests. In fact, you can see my daughter there is holding a poster in Canada which says, basically, save Belandur Lake. And so there were lots of people, thousands of people who came out into the street. And that's not easy in a modern city to have that many people coming out and protest for an environmental movement. So these you know, pan-Bangalore movements have been extremely successful. Another example, for instance, is uh, last year, there was a steel flyover that was supposed to be built and was going to threaten 2,254 trees from being cut. And there have been another number of lake of tree protests by a number of groups across Bangalore. This was perhaps one of the largest uh, ones, which was extremely successful because it stopped all the trees from getting felled and the entire steel fiber project has been scrapped. So these are projects that are beginning to fundamentally question India's cities and their mode of development. That do we need this kind of private development where we have real estate growth everywhere, roads everywhere, and you know, just say that the commons are, an, uh, are a lamented but necessary casualty. And communities are beginning to get out and say, no, 
we want our commons and we want them to be protected as our commons. But in doing so, they clash with other views of the modern city. So again, with the, at the same protest, there was a small splinter group, some say paid for by the real estate developers that were doing this protest, which came up with a very set of inter very interesting signs. They said, we want Bangalore to be Singapore, essentially saying, why are you stopping this construction? It would convert Bangalore into a Singapore. Why, uh, how does the wetland matter? Or who is sponsoring NGOs? The idea being uh, an idea that is often spoken about in India today that non-government organizations questioning certain models of development must be funded by some vested interests. So you're trying to um, impugn the motives of the community that is out here to say, save the wetland, saying, no, you may be funded by someone else. So there was a very interesting clash. You know, what, one of the things I saw there was, was uh, you know, truly inspiring where you saw young children at the forefront because what happened was the men who came in the opposite group uh, against the protest were extremely large and extremely menacing in their body language. And when they came close, all the children moved forward. And since the children were in the forefront of the community protest, the men couldn't do anything because after all, you, you, know, you have cameras around and you can't beat up small children. And so they stepped back and you see the power, you know, when you're part of that movement and you can see the tangible uh, force of communities, and what they can achieve. I think that's very inspiring. And that really helps you push back with the, against these views of the modern city. And you know, from there, from our experiences working with these lake groups, we started looking at how do these lakes actually help in terms of imaginations of new commons. So we have a new research project now where we're looking at placemaking and environmental stewardship and trying to see if these new urban commons, what kinds of uh, nodes of environmental placemaking do they become? And we can see that there are diverse communities that come together and value the importance of the lake. For instance, the photograph at the top is of my uh, migrant labor group, labor group who comes from another part of North Karnataka, forced out of their landscapes because of climate change and the lack of water that makes their uh, farming livelihoods unviable. They have moved to the city, as have millions of other people across India. Now, their normal fate would be to end up as construction labor. <coughs> Excuse me but they much prefer to come and work at the lake because they say their children get to grow up because the children are with them all day, get to grow up at the side of a lake and you know, breathing fresh air and under their eyes in a clean and healthy environment. So this is the reason why they choose the lake. They get a little less pay than in fact than they do in a, as construction labor, but they find this much better place to work in. The lady below, is from the original village community that was part of the lake. She calls herself a child of the lake, the lake's Dattaputri. And she said that her mother, in fact, dedicated her to the lake when she was a baby. And she has seen the lake transform in front of her eyes, all the wells and all the farming landscapes that have disappeared around the lake. But she still retains a very strong attachment. There are many others. There's a mother of a differently abled child who comes every morning to, one, to a lake next to this. Uh, because it's a calm space, it's less visited, and her child who needs to let off steam before he gets into the regular day, school day, which he finds quite difficult. The lake comes in down. It's a place of nature that provides him with a sense of calm. And so she comes here. There are corporate employees who come here to the lake for a few hours a day in the evening with a flask of tea to relax before they get back into their corporate environment. There are transgender communities that come and relax in the lake because they say this is a place that is non-threatening and if they want to just sit somewhere, they often get harassed in a public space because the police ask them to move and people yell at them. So they find this as a safe haven. People forge old and new connections here. And this really, you know, you can get a sense of why in this kind of place, in this kind of an environment, it's a commons that leads to the forging of bonds of collective action that stimulate further collective action and that stimulate people to then act on different things. Most people that we talk to from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds said that yes, they were willing to invest time then in protection of other kinds of urban commons and had come to think of the city as a different place, as a place that they want to be more interactive in. So in doing this, we've started looking at how can we then get these ideas of the city forward to other groups. <coughs> because we don't want this to stop at just research. We've organized a number of photo exhibitions at public events at the Kerehabo, the Lake Festival, at science fairs, we've con and at other places, we conduct lake walks in the city. We do a number of talks and interactions in schools and colleges. We've been collaborating with a number of civic and community groups, giving public talks, talking to government officials about how we can 
actually worked with the city to work on commons protection. And some of these have been very interesting. So we, for instance, a bilingual, one of the PhD students who would come in from the Netherlands was working on slums at the end of lakes. And what she found was that people often vilify slums as places where people don't care about the commons, but she found incredible stories of environmental protection done by these slums because they were the original residents often near the lakes and they had an older relationship with the lake that was much more organic and much more connected to the lake as the idea of commons. So you'll see below a photograph of a lady looking at herself actually. So these people were photographed at the lake and their stories of how they protect the lake, how they see Bangalore, what they feel about the city as commons. We had this bilingually written in English as well as in Kannada. And they came to the same lake exhibition, which we held at a metro station. And it was interesting. The reason we did this was we often find that when we talk about things like the commons in Bangalore, you'd end up preaching to the choir. The, kind of, the group that comes in already agrees with you. So how do you reach the groups that are not thinking of the commons or are not thinking of this imagination of the city? And so if you're doing a metro station, you have footfall. People that are just going about their daily lives that walk in to this exhibition because it's free and it's open. And they ended up coming out telling us, you know, I go past this every day on my way home and I never even looked at this place. I never even thought about these people. And I'm going to think about this place and the city very differently now. And it was a very nice uh, opportunity also for us to get people to look at these residents, you know, residents of slums, for instance, who do incredible work on the commons to get their stories out into the public and to make people listen to their stories with just giving them a little better of a you know, vantage point to make their presence felt. I'll conclude now by saying this is broadly the idea that, that we've been looking at. How do we convert the lament of commons lost in the urban environment to a tale of commons found or commons reimagined? And what are the dangers associated with this and what are the plus sides? Of course, there are many dangers. <coughs> in many cities of the global south, but not just here, even in the northern cities like London or the US, you find that commons landscapes are increasingly becoming gated. There are guards, there are timings, there are rules and regulations on who can access them and who can't and for what purposes they can be accessed or not accessed, right? And this leads to the exclusion of a lot of the poor, a lot of disadvantaged, a lot of differently abled, a lot of uh, sections like transgender communities, a lot of uh, fishing and grazing activities or livelihood support. People who used to depend on the commons, for instance, are now getting excluded and it's a certain type of people better off, relatively wealthy look a certain way, act a certain way, who are allowed to access this. And the commons increasingly are becoming privatized or converted into public but gated spaces. So this is one imagination of the city of commons also that we need to guard against. And so that part of this is what we've been struggling with. How do you twin commons research with action? A few things that have worked for us, one is the fact that we draw on global knowledge in addition to be very strongly rooted in the context of the local. So for instance, the very fact that Eleanor Ostrom came to Kaikonrili Lake and planted a tree, it's a very powerful force often when you're talking to local officials or to media about the importance of this lake. The fact that there is this global network of commons that you can rely on gives you some certain credibility in, for local communities. On the other hand, being locally rooted for the communities makes them you know, that's very important because you can't be someone from the outside working on commons action in a local context. You must have local people working on their own commons. And there, you know, the people working on Kaikondrali Lake are very different from the people working on Jakur Lake from the Putinhali Lake. Each place has to have its own community that comes together. So this combination of the global plus the local, I think really makes a difference. The second is the idea of the commons in a place like India is very powerful because it gives you a way of balancing social and ecological needs. Right? Unless you have that coming together, you're not going to have, uh, you can't move forward. You can't talk about pure ecological conservation in India cities anymore. You have so many social needs. And the commons, on the other hand, gives you a way of balancing both the social and the ecological. It helps you make trade-offs explicit. For instance, do you want this particular lake to be a bird reserve? In which case, do you want to keep fishing out? Here's the balance. What happens, you know, and what do you lose in terms of livelihoods and social uses? What do you gain in terms of ecological uses? So it helps you make certain 
making these trade offs explicit we found really makes a difference when to cut past heated emotions and just say okay what is the trade off that you actually trying for instance there are lakes that want uh, now night lights and so that people can jog at night that's not good for biodiversity but that's important for security so where do you make these trade offs again you know some of these questions come up in that it's been very useful for us also to link outreach with research and finally to write and we write extensively on our research for local for the public in english as well as in local languages mainly in kannada so with this i'll wind up i just want to thank azim prem university for the research funding and uh, my other colleagues and collaborators hitam nikrishnan manjunatha b and shukanya basu who worked on aspects of this research thank you so much harine that was that was truly very insightful um what i'm going to do now is we have few, we have we have ten, about 13 minutes now i'm going to open up the floor to anyone who has any questions um if you have any questions remember you could ask those in the q and a box at the bottom um i'll give you 30 seconds to to type down something and if not i have a few questions myself All right looks like we don't have anyone ask any questions but i i do have i do have a question maybe i could get your your opinion on this as well it's a two part question um the first being you know historically we know that um we know that the indian culture of india is very traditional you know a lot of our values and beliefs have been passed down to us from generations before um do you think that urbanization is responsible for like the shift in perspective from um from being you know an you know a natural a natural environment to shift yeah. to a more urban environment um and the second question being if so how do you propose that you know we mitigate uh, excessive unmanaged urbanization and a great example is um the ra colony in mumbai and you know how they have the the development plan for 2034 um so maybe if you could shed some light on that that would be fantastic sure uh, so it is i mean if you look at indian cities i well all of india i mean one of the reasons why i think a lot of uh, nature survives still in these threatened places is because people have the very deep cultural connections and sacred beliefs about nature and this is in a lot of indian religions you know jainism buddhism sikhism islam christianity the way it's practiced in india as well as hinduism so we've really seen even in cities that a lot of these sacred condition, uh, traditions survive for instance you i think in most indian cities it's common to see that you know one large road no trees and then you know on either side and then suddenly in the middle of the road there's one sacred tree which no one is going to touch and because this is largest is a keystone species there are bat colonies that are protected there are monkeys the troops that are protected because they're sacred so there's a lot of nature preservation that still survives there is of course a lot that gets threatened and wiped away in the lake that i described for instance there were a lot of lake, there was a lake goddess in fact there were three lake goddesses around different parts of the lake and they were worshiped in different ways and you find that tradition has now moved because the the lake goddess no longer survives in this new form of the gated and protected lake she's been moved out to a temple a few meters down you know on the side of the road so she's there but she doesn't she's not associated with the lake it which means the the protection of the lake all takes a different form now so there is this difficulty in terms of how do you manage these traditions in some places they survive in some places they're less like like the sacred tree in the middle of the road in some places like the lake goddesses they're much less likely to survive and we're still trying to figure out what kinds of contexts make some of these places more protected than the others but in terms of the broader issue of you know like you raised ra colony for instance in mumbai there's so many cities now across india i think where citizen movements are gathering uh, force so just like the steel flyover was uh, pro- um, beda movement in bangalore was able to save some 2020 200 trees ra colony there's a large movement to save the trees in that uh, large place which is going to get affected by the construction of the metro and in delhi similarly in south delhi when the government started municipality started cutting down a lot of trees for redevelopment there have been 
you know, public interest litigation, massive road protests, tree hugging, and a lot of, very importantly, a lot of people getting together and getting to know each other that would not have happened without this. And I think that feeds off each other. Now the people in Bombay know the people in Delhi know the people in Bangalore. So there are fan India collectives that are beginning to form of people that are exchanging messages on social media or you know, other kinds of knowledge networks, meeting physically, et cetera. So I think that makes a big difference. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense too. Yeah. I'm just going to refer back to the question box to see if anyone has any questions. Um, so there's, there's a question. We have a few more minutes. Yeah, we have, there's a question from Arjuna. She says, is there any example of local livelihoods being supported by commons in city slash <coughs> urban spaces? Plenty. Even in the heart of Bangalore, you still find grazing going on next to many lakes. There is fishing. So most lakes have fishing contracts, which fishermen you know, have, and they support, they support those livelihoods. There are still migrant workers will come and pluck fuel wood. There are medicinal plants that people will use. People from the slums come in and pluck some greens. They're sold on uh, you know, little carts. The number of livelihoods that in the heart of the city, you'd be surprised. We've been doing a lot of research and you know, you'd really be surprised what goes on under your nose that you don't normally see. So commons in the heart of the city sub support a lot of traditional livelihoods still. And this is not unique to Bangalore. You see this in Delhi, you see this in Bombay. No, the large cities, not just the, obviously the small cities, but also the large cities. Fantastic. Um, I'll give it another 30 seconds to see if there are any other questions that are flowing in. But yeah, thank you for that talk. I think that you address a lot of issues that I feel, um, you know, require a different, a different avenue of approach. You know, a, a regular governmental approach might not help. And, you know, you shedding light on some of the more cultural aspects um, of maintaining public spaces, you know, conserving land, preserving land. Um, yeah. I see there's a lot of significance in that. It always comes back when you say commons, whose commons, maintained by whom and for whom, right? And right, so a lot of right. the imagination of the commons comes in. And that's where cities have to have, they figure out what their own imagination is and figure out if they can make that an inclusive imagination. Because that's, I think, one of the challenges, especially in Indian cities, with the kind of inequality that you see. But also globally, I think, most cities are generally unequal. Right. All right. So I think from the looks of it, I, we're going to conclude this session. Um, again, on behalf of, of the IASC and the World Common Week organizers, I'd like to thank all the attendees for coming in and listening in on the talk. And of course, Rini for preparing and giving this fantastic webinar session. Um, before I close, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, address two events that the IASC is, is proposing. So if you're interested in, in, in Commons activities, the first event is in November. It's their first virtual conference for anyone who wants to join. And in July next year, uh, the IASC is holding its biennial in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And if you, want to, if you want to apply for that, the deadlines are on November 15th. Again, all this information is available on the World Commons Week website. Um, and again, just to finish off, I'd like to thank Irini again for being part of this, which I think is a historic event. It's never happened before. Um, no, it has. Yeah. yeah. But yes, so thank everyone. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Fantastic. All right. Have a lovely, right. have a lovely day. Bye-bye.